<clears throat> Welcome everyone. As you come in, I um, will ask you to mute your microphone and please keep it muted um, throughout. Uh, if I do hear any outside noise, I may go ahead and mute it for you. Um, I am going to let you know that we are going to save questions until the end for this session. So please put them in the chat box and we will be sending out a recording of the session afterwards. It'll probably take either later today or, or tomorrow to get it processed onto the Maryland Online YouTube channel. I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, Don Bone is an associate professor and director of the Multimedia Technology Program at Allegheny College of Maryland. And Glenda Hernandez Tittle is a professor and program coordinator for the Education Department at Montgomery College. And I'm going to turn off my camera and turn it over to our speakers. So thank you. Okay, Wendy, thank you uh, for the invitation and um, I appreciate uh, being able to share and uh, uh, I'm John Bone, like I said, or like Wendy said, from Allegheny College of Maryland. And I also have with me. Hi, hi, I'm Glenda Hernandez Tittle from Montgomery College. I am in the School of Education. So welcome to the presentation today. I see many online today interested in this topic. We were supposed to present back in uh, March, maybe, uh, when the pandemic hit. And so we elected to hold off on it because we were all uh, scampering trying to get things online. So I appreciate you bearing with us and uh, allowing us to reschedule for the presentation. So first of all, we want to um, get your your feedback. What are you looking for here? So we'd like to start off by just asking you if you could type in in the chat box, what do you know about flex flexible course offerings and what do you want to know? So what do you know so far about it and what do you want to know about it? Um, and if Wendy, if you could help us kind of um, just synthesize or summarize some of the uh, responses that hopefully come in. So again, go ahead and post your comments in the chat box. I am trying to see the chat, but I can't see it right now. I'm sure yeah. why. So I'll have to rely on you, Wendy. Uh, I will. Um, well, we have our first one. How do the classes meet credit hour requirements for in-class and out-of-class work? It's a great question. Okay. And then Another one is, I uh, don't know a lot about them, and I'm trying to see how they are managed in terms of, oh my gosh, they're coming in fast now, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't know a lot about them, and I'm trying to see how they are managed in terms of grading, managing students, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, another comment, all new to me. Another one, I am interested in knowing the logistics, how does it work in reality. I am interested in the design of the courses. I think these are courses when some students are in person and some are remote. I would just like to know what your experience is with this and how you do it. Uh, I actually did see your presentation at the DLA convention last year. It was great. This is refreshing my memory of this presentation. And the last one concerned about faculty and system support issues. Okay, so great questions. Yeah, um, so we'll probably address all those as we're sharing today. So I think uh, those questions will be in. So I think we're set up well. So uh, just a little bit about a learning outcomes for this uh, presentation. We're going to define high flex. Now we say the term high flex and flex is used interchangeably. At Allegheny College, we call it flex courses. At Montgomery College, they call it um, high flex. So the term is a term is different, but the meaning is the same, even though the institutions uh, call it different things. Um, so just be aware of that. Identify the benefits of high flex courses for your students. And of course, compare approaches because we looked at this from different angles and use different technologies, but still accomplishing the same goal in high flex. Uh, we'll review the process of how things were developed at our institutions. Um, we'll discuss tips and strategies, things 
learned um, logistics and uh, with pedagogy and identify the steps to create your high flex course if you're interested in so what is high flex i think this is mine is this my slide or is it glenda's that's yours <laughs> oh okay did i i went out of order i think it's okay no you're doing great <laughs> The definition. So um, some people may think high flex online or hybrid blended. Um, very similar. However, the most meaningful part of a high flex course or a flex course at Allegheny College is students can attend however they see fit, however they are, it's convenient for them and change those modalities throughout the semester. So for example, if they register face class, they have to attend face to face. If they register for an online class, it's online 100%. A blended class may have one week in the class, one week out of the class, or one day of the week in the class, one day of the week out of class, and using that to the advantage of scheduling, etc. But the idea of high flex, students can choose when they attend class and how they attend class. So for example, if a student is sick, their child is sick, um, they can stay home and watch the live class. Or maybe they're at the hospital and they can't log in right there. They can watch the class later. Or they can come to the face-to-face. -face. And they can choose these modes throughout the semester, whatever best suits them. For example, maybe they're okay in a certain topic or subject area that you're discussing. And they can complete things online. But other more complex com uh, subject areas and subject matters of your course require them to be in person because they need that one-on-one -on -one instruction or that, that physical location. So the idea is we can manipulate or we can change throughout the semester. It doesn't have to be one way. And that's the main point. It's not online. It's not blended. It's not face-to-face. -face. It's all of them. So as I said before, the different names, high flex and flex. Um, so it could be going by a different name depending on the institution. Um, there's little research on this. Um, uh, admittedly, there's little research. So we're kind of doing this, if you will. As I said before, three modes of delivery. And these modes are all delivered simultaneously. So we have to make sure we keep that in mind as faculty developing a course and running a course, we're managing three different modalities all at the same time. We'll talk about that. So students choose how they attend. That's pretty important because we want to give autonomy to the students being able to be flexible, especially in these times, right? We have, we all have to be flexible, um, but things are changing, right? There is a short video, um, which you can look up on you hard to play online. It's just kind of a commercial that we created here at Allegheny College for our high flex courses. What it is not, as I said before, it is not blended. Blended will take a certain portion of the course will be online, a certain portion will be face to face. Now some instructors will do 50% online, 50% face to face. It's not that. It's blended. It's online and it's all face to face all at the same time. So it is more work. However, students really enjoy flex courses. So I hate to be the one talking all the time, but kind of the order of these slides. Uh, so Glenda will take over here in a bit. Wanted to talk how this came about at Allegheny College several years ago. So first of all, it is learner centered. So giving students choices, options on how they complete things, students like that, being able to choose, right? We had an aging distance learning system. And um, of course, technology is constantly changing. And we had gone through, I believe, three distance learning systems where because we have other campuses and other remote sites that are all linked by video conferencing systems. So that system was aging. Date, so we needed to update something, change our way of thinking. Because years ago, this was the only way to communicate between those, those campuses. The internet wasn't as robust. People did not have broadband, so we had to change things up. We were looking for something different. 
of course, it's innovative. We want to be innovative. We try to be innovative in, it, in our teaching to keep students engaged, right? Um, but the design of this course, flex course and high flex courses uh, benefit many students from various backgrounds. Also, UD, U, UDL, Universal Design. So design, you'll you will talk about how the course was designed but it's an online course but there's different ways you can design it and different activities you can incorporate because you have asynchronous and synchronous online and face to face all at the same time that can be a challenge so as all we're trying new things to boost enrollment so we we chose this uh, as one of the um, one of the legs that we can maybe boost enrollment and giving students more options because if they could not attend a face-to-face -face course, they could sign up for this flex course. We also, um, just to give you an idea of where I came from, uh, I, we developed this here at Allegheny College. I piloted it. I shared it at the Maryland Distance Learning Association Conference uh, a few years ago and then also uh, for, at the League for Innovation in 2018. And I didn't put in there uh, in 2000, uh, Glenda and um, Buddy from Montgomery College and I, we traveled to the US DLA conference to present in Nashville last year uh, in 2019. So talking a little about Allegheny College specifically, the idea was brought forth to administration. It was not my idea. Um, somebody saw it done somewhere else. And however, um, I'm technologically savvy, so I was able to think, how could I do it? And I, I think I, uh, and I know a colleague of mine uh, is on here today, at least one that I saw come in. Um, I think I, I try to be as innovative as, as, as possible at, at the college here and try to uh, do new things and I'm okay with it. Um, so. We had support for the development um, from the administration. And more importantly, the instructional technology area of the campus was instructional designers helping us develop. So at this point, we had interested faculty come on board. The technology requirements were discussed and answered for, both, for uh, all three of the faculty, the students, and the institution itself. What technologies would we need in place for delivering a flex course. We had training and support, again, by the instructional technologies area. It's called ELETS here. So ELETS was able to train faculty and being able to support them. Luckily, I'm in the same building. So when I had a question, I just walked down the hall and asked. Uh, so that was convenient. We had to discuss the legality of recording classes in the state of Maryland. Uh, if you did not know, I hope most know that in the state of Maryland, you cannot legally record somebody without their knowledge, not consent, their knowledge. So it's stated up front in the syllabus, it's posted on the doors inside the classroom that the class may be audio recorded. Um, and of course, if you're in Zoom, you're recording in Zoom, if there's a little record showing that it's being recorded. We also had to uh, have the section redesign. Now, I'm a professor, uh, an associate professor of multimedia technology, the director of that program, photos, videos, that kind of thing. However, uh, I do teach a couple sections, sections of computer. Wanted to try this on the, the sections because there's more data in those sections because multiple instructors teach those. So I decided to do that course. I had full support from the director of and the, the chair of the computer science division. And then once everything was designed and it's a hunt designed 100% online because technically somebody could take the class 100% online. Right, um, so it has to be designed as a 100% online course. Therefore, it had to go through our internal process of review, similar to what Quality Matters is, but the internal review. So it had to meet certain standards before it was even been made available. So I, I spent a summer doing that. At that time, I was off contract during the summer, so I was able to develop those things. Um, so. That's our, our steps here. And then finally, there were some updates that I had to do. 
Um, and I, I don't want to brag, but I did a pretty good job of designing the course. So there weren't too many updates that I had to do after the review. And then the course is ready for delivery. So I'm going to let Glenda share how the process went in Montgomery. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so um, I actually attended the MDLA conference. Are you able to get it to the next screen with the content, John? Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. um, in 2018, and I actually I went to John's uh, presentation, and I would uh, I was super excited. I literally ran out of the session to find. Um, our VP of uh, technology at uh, Montgomery College because I knew we, there was a grant, we, there was a grant offering and I just thought, oh my gosh, we have to do this. Um, especially because as John said, we're always thinking about how can we make courses more accessible? How can we continue to be flexible with um, just scheduling and offerings? Every, every institution is doing it that or should be doing that. And this is pre-COVID. Um, and so I was just really excited about uh, what he presented. And like I said, fortunately there was uh, a grant I wrote uh, a grant on it and we were able to get the funding for the technology. I think it's really important um, to note that, and we'll get to this in a little bit, uh, that the way that we've set it up, that our initial setups looked quite different, uh, especially because we received, I think it was a $50,000, $75,000 grant. Um, just for the technology in this in this room. Um, luckily, it was approved just because of how innovative the idea was. Um, but you know, John's uh, John's technology looked quite different. And like I said, we we will come back to that. So don't let that number scare you. For don't go anywhere. Um, you know, if that number is scaring you, because you, there are different ways that you can do it. Uh, we did have to, luckily, John actually helped us a lot, supported us a lot uh, with the logistics. Um, and he's been very transparent about his background. My background, I'm a teacher. I'm in the School of Education. I prepare teachers. My background is not in technology. Um, so I think that transparency on his part is really important because I, I needed a lot more supports than probably he did from IT to get everything set up, and especially with um, the how sophisticated some of our some of our um, equipment was. I think that kind of added to it. Um, so that's how we got started. We watched John. We thought it was pretty magical. We wrote a grant, got the equipment, and then started piloting it. So. Um, again, Glenda talks about the differences in uh, not only our disciplines, but our level, our skill level of technology. So here's a, a table that shows a little bit about the differences from Allegheny College to Montgomery. Now, there's a great disparity between our campuses. So statistically speaking, in the state of Maryland, most people may know this, that um, Allegheny County is the poorest county and Montgomery County is the more a more wealthy county and probably one of the most wealthy county. So our size is significantly different as well uh, as far as on the credit side uh, how many students we have. So but we talk about this because it doesn't matter where you're coming from as Glenda said. Um, they were able to get a grant for their money Ours was funded more internally from uh, funds from the instructional fairs. So essentially uh, at Allegheny College, we started off with a webcam. Uh, we recently updated some room classrooms in our uh, technology building because it's been being renovated. And um, we do actually have cameras in the back of the room uh, as well now. So uh, that is one difference, an upgrade. Um, we do use lavalier microphones in the rooms because that direct sound is more appealing than just a hollow room sound. And then you have air conditioning noise on top of that, et cetera. 
um, we started off with just simple speakers and then we got ceiling speakers put into the room. We were streaming uh, and recording classes using GoToMeeting at the time. We've changed over to Zoom now. So we began with GoToMeeting. We archived the class by uploading to YouTube, uh, an unlisted YouTube channel, and then posting that link in Blackboard and Brightspace. And uh, of course, now we use Microsoft Product Stream. We have the instructor workstation, which is essentially just a, a, a classroom computer, which has the webcam attached, et cetera. And of course, we're using, uh, we had Blackboard. We started off with Blackboard in this process uh, and have changed um, over the last year and a half space. Uh, so that's where Allegheny College is coming from. And uh, for us, I think there, there were a lot of similarities um, except one of our biggest ticket items was the camera. And it was, John, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm asking you what we had, but um, the camera actually, I think was a purchase through Echo 360. We actually thought that we would be using Echo 360 and that was part of um, our ignorance at the time, we misunderstood what Echo 360 could really do. Echo 360 is a great product, but it was not really aligned with what we wanted because it's, it's about engagement in the class um, for everybody who's in the class. However, we were able to install a camera that was able to move around completely around the room. We had speakers on the ceilings. We had, um, and we'll show you a, a visual of this, um, the TV monitor um, on the side. So the whole entire class could see those folks joining us from Zoom. And we did have the smart instructor workstation as well um, and Brightlink. And um, I do wanna note that we started using Collaborate and it was just really wonky. We just, it just didn't work really well. Um, and then we moved to GoToMeeting and then we moved to Zoom and we stayed in Zoom. Once we found Zoom, it was just the best option for us. It, it had the most features for what we needed and that's what we continue to use. So as Glenn mentioned earlier, this was pre-COVID. Um, so Zoom was not the the hot thing, the hot product at the time. Uh, it was just another meeting, conference meeting uh, application. Uh, so just to show you a little visual representation of my classroom. So here's a, a picture of the classroom space that uh, we began in. Again, this was just updated and the room has a more fresh look. Um, furniture is the same, but it has a fresh look now uh, with the updates. The uh, talking a little bit about my curriculum, what I'm teaching again, computer literacy, which is Comp 101, which is offered at any, any institution. Uh, we talk about the uh, concepts of computers, how they work, and then we talk about Office. And we primarily use uh, for assessment a uh, Cengage product, MindTap slash SAM, um, for those those uh, areas. And every class the same material, the same content. Um, now the order can be switched up, et cetera, but uh, each instructor uh, is using the same textbook, the same MindTap, Cengage uh, site. And that's where I'm coming from here in Allegheny. Okay, and so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, my classes. And I actually have seen a couple of questions come in, great questions come in about how does this work if you have group activities? Somebody mentioned specifically nursing um, or fitness. Um, and again, this is pre-COVID, right? Like now everybody has to do, like figure out how to do it, you have to do it. But uh, for me being in, in teacher education, that was a significant, part of my planning. I did not want to, um, and, and I, I hope what I will say comes across how I'm intending to say it. I think there were differences in courses. Some courses can be delivered in a much more didactic manner, and that's just the nature of the course. For us, um, teacher education is very interactive, lots of discussions, lots of group work, lots of demonstrations, presentations, et cetera. And because of that, we really 
um, that's one of the reasons we added some additional items to the class. So if you look here, and it's hard to see, but there's two images at, at the bottom. And this is where I'm presenting. The one on the left, it, that's actually, I think that's me, <laughs> or it's a student. Um, but that is the visual of the class that is in class, what we, what the student would be able to see from home. That's what they're seeing in class or in class picture. And so when we had group activities, we actually, I assigned students who were joining us um, asynchronously to a group, either a group that was, I'm sorry, the group, the students who were joining us synchronously, I assigned them to work together with the other folks who were working synchronously, or sometimes I would even assign them to a group that was in the class. And then what we saw on our side, if you look at the right hand, um, uh, at the right screen, bottom right screen, that's one of our students who was sharing out his warm up results or a question. So the entire class was able to see who was talking and obviously listen to him. And I think this was a really distinct, uh, you know, this is, this is a big difference between some of the folks and the technology use, because I know some folks say, well, I do this with my laptop right in front of me. Well, if you're doing it with the laptop right in front of you, the rest of the class can only see, uh, it doesn't see the students. Um, and the students who are joining synchronously can't see, they just can't see each other. So here is another image. So as you can see, um, that is the workstation, the smaller picture on the left. And then the larger picture, uh, the, the front screen, the one I'm pointing to was the content. That's the content that I would deliver to the class. And that screen was also shown to, that's what the students could see via Zoom. However, in that, if you see that TV on the right-hand side wall, when students were logging in, the students in the class could see the students joining us via Zoom. So if we had a discussion, um, it was easy for me to say, John, what did you have for this question? And even if he's joining us synchronous, uh, if he's joining us synchronously, virtually, he was still able to join. And the class, the students who are in person are able to look, see who's talking, listen to them, and often engage with them. Uh, because if you look closely, you can see um, the, the speakers uh, uh, that were on top of the ceiling as well. This didn't catch the camera, this picture, but. Um, so I hope that starts to answer a little bit about the logistics of how we, we bring, that, that was really important for me. I didn't want you just join us you know, virtually. I want you to be part of the class. And when you come to class, even if you're virtually joining us synchronously, then you will be participating. Um, there is this other question about, and I can talk about it now, um, well, what happens if you're joining us asynchronously? This is where the additional work comes in, and hopefully I'm answering some of the questions posted. Well, for those folks, there would be a discussion, like a warm-up discussion, and there would be an activity that they would have to complete that would resemble what we did in class. So those are the three different ways that students will be, would be able to access the class content and hopefully access what, what you know, some of the discussions and what their peers are sharing about the content we're covering. Yeah, a good point. Um, and Glenda, just to talk about groups for a moment, I know questions in the chat. Um, so, if you have, depending on the number of students in any location at the synchronous uh, session, um, generally group work, you would, you know, gather around several students in the classroom in different groups. Um, so if you have a smaller number of attendees online, the online could be a group and then you could just mute your microphone or mute your speakers so they could have their group discussion. 
at that time. Also in Zoom and then GoToMeeting when we, we had used it, we can break out groups and uh, you know, there are certain ways and each platform does it a little differently, but you can create groups within your Zoom meeting and then send them to a group where they're communicating together with that group and then bring them back at a certain time. Um, so that might help with the uh, addressing how do we do group and group activities. Um, and again, we have to think this all out, um, that the activities that we do in class, how, we can, how can we adapt them to somebody who's doing asynchronous um, in completing and learning the same, same uh, achieving the same goals and the end outcome, so to speak. Why high flex? Why would you do this? And why would you do it now? So first of all, it allows for more flexibility in students so they can attend how they best, how best fits their schedule. It's all also accessible, um, meaning that if a student comes face to face, they're in that class face to face and um, then they go home, right? And they're, they're based on their notes or you know, the assignment, et cetera. But now everything is accessible. So it's like a face to face class supplemented by that online content. Again, more student choice. We discussed that already, and students can cho choose how they uh, attend class at any point. I can't stress that enough. That's the most important factor of high flex, high flex courses. You can attend how you want, whenever you want. So uh, ensure students uh, can access the material. Again, talking about some st online students and face-to-face -face students, we, we have to do things differently. Um, depending on how we're delivering. Of course, it addresses equity because some students may not have access to certain material or certain content. Now we can go back and watch the video of what we did in class. Maybe we need a review or maybe we didn't attend. We can go back and watch that uh, very easily. And now uh, after, you know, post COVID, online learning is becoming more acceptable remote remote learning. I don't want to say online. Online, um, depending on what department you're talking to. So financial aid, online is this thing over here and face-to-face -face is this this thing. So the remote, remote learning is becoming uh, more common, uh, you know, even in in uh, school systems, grade schools even, uh, with, with today's... Uh, So we do want to discuss some of the outcomes um, and what students have to say about it. So first of all, here at ACM, I found a direct correlation to the students who actually attended class synchronously. And it could be face-to-face -face or online, but the ones who were attending synchronously and their final grade. So there were improved final grades if they because throughout the semester, every semester, I track how each student attends class, if they're online, if they're face-to-face, -face, or I don't know. Um, it, it says unknown in my uh, attendance. So three different modes. So I can say this person attended, let's say out of 45 meetings, 15 weeks, three times a week, 45 meetings, they showed up 33 uh, times face-to-face and or a combination of face-to-face -face online synchronous. So I could determine that those who attended the synchronous sessions were able to do better. Well, I was thinking, well, it could be because they're more invested because they are there and they're taking the initiative. So that kind of a, is explanatory. Also, there is a 3% higher rate of success or higher grade percentage in a flex course, statistically speaking, because um, I've looked at this, I've asked for the data, um, and 3% percentage points higher in a flex course. Now, I teach flex course, uh, the flex course um, here at the college, and the only computer literacy uh, section until this, this uh, more recently. So it could be just because me as an instructor and how I've designed it, um, because each, of, each instructor can design their own course however they see fit. So maybe because I design well, or maybe I'm just an awesome teacher. I don't know. Uh, so 
it could be those differences. But I want to stress here, similar outcomes. There's no difference. Um, now, I, I was very concerned the first semester because it seemed like those who took flex course, um, I, I had more, um, more people have lower grades than higher grades. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is not the outcome I wanted. However, several semesters now and combining all that data, the outcomes are very similar, but 3%. Uh, so the 3% is not that big a difference, but if you're at an 89%, it is a big difference in letter grade. So that's some of the outcomes of the uh, here at ACM, but most, most importantly, the students are not losing anything by taking a flex course. So statistically right now, it's a little bit better. And for Montgomery College, we've really seen um, similar results. Um, there was a correlation between those who access content through high flex options and went beyond face-to-face -face with grades. So what I mean by that is most, most of our students did some combination, came to class face-to-face, -face, but they accessed the other options, even for those students who would say, I am a face-to-face -face person and I want to be here. That's just the best way that I learn. My car broke down. My child care didn't come through. I'm not feeling great. And so having that accessibility of joining synchronously or asynchronously to still access the content is what really pushed them over. So, um, you know, like, like John said, this is all relatively new, but thus far, we, I, we're, I think we're seeing really positive results, especially when it comes to just multiple options for all students. And I think you're always going to have, and John and I have discussed this, you're always going to have the students who are primarily face-to-face. -face. I really like, you know, the asynchronous or uh, the synchronous part. But we're seeing that the, the folks who, who have to rely on, on a different option than what they think is their option are the ones that that's where we see that, that it did make a difference. The fact that they had the option and they access that option. Yeah. So let's, to, let's explore some, some of the things that students have said. At the end of the semester, I have a survey built into my course that I ask my students to take. As additionally, there's course reviews every course, every semester um, from general, uh, general college. So, um, and so we're gonna talk about or show, display some of the feedback I have from students. And I'll just give you, a, just to read through these I, because I don't need to read them word for word. So just take a moment. And we're gonna show you two of these slides and what we'd like for you to do is just think about what resonates with you um what do you think uh where do you think your students could benefit based on what you're reading and again there's going to be two of these slides where it's it is student voices and we just like for you to think about what stands out to you about these comments from our students So in relationship to what we do here at Allegheny College, and I'm saying that I have a survey built into my course um, and the general college um, assessment, I have found, and I have a question in my survey, in the course survey that ask, um, would you take another flex course? And 100% of the students, and that's the, of course, the quantitative data, 100% of said they would take another flex course. Um, and of course, this is a qualitative data we're looking at here. So let me go on to the next slide so we can uh, reflect a little bit on those comments.
So as Glenda said, um, if you type in the chat, um, what do you think strikes you the most about these comments? What, what sticks out to you? And I think I'm going to have to rely on Glenda because, again, I can't, see, the chat isn't opening up for me. Convenience. Students identifying specific reasons why they like the format, transportation issues. Provides a chance for all students to be successful in no matter their circumstances. Opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue on with the presentation. So tips and strategies. So the lessons we've learned um, over the uh, last several years doing this. So first of all, logistics. Number one, number one, number one, always have a backup plan. Technology, right? Um, now, as Glenda said, I, I probably are familiar with technology than Glenda. I have a bachelor's degree in, in computer technology. Um, so I'm more comfortable and I can, if something isn't working in my classroom properly, I can troubleshoot a little bit. Of course, I, I don't have passwords and things. I'm not trusted enough as most of us are not. Um, so uh, I can troubleshoot a little bit. However, make a backup plan, have a backup plan and let the student go up front that this is a flex course and we never know about those, those, uh, things that might creep up. The internet might be down, um, our connection is, is weak, what, whatever it is. Um, it's not easy. This is not easy, it's a not an easy process. However, I think it's rewarding. Like I said, I was, I was the, out of the, I think there are four or five faculty that volunteered to pilot this thing uh, when it first came up here at Allegheny College. Uh, one by one, they started dropping, drop I think because they work that needed to be done to design a whole new course from scratch. It wasn't just, you know, changing things in their course, uh, had, had to go through that process and the extra work involved essentially, but it is so rewarding to be able to see those comments that we just, um, to have students be successful who may not have been able to be successful in the past. Um, keep in mind because this is three modalities, essentially three modalities in the same time. You have more planning, of course, the planning, the development of the course, but then planning of um, working in your, your discipline to figure out, well, what, what activities do we need? What will be beneficial for the online group versus the face-to-face -face versus the synchronous online, all those things. So all that extra work means a more of a time commitment from faculty. Now here at ACM, uh, I, was, I was kind of uh, thinking of this. I was wondering why people were dropping off the pilot and I was the only one left. And like I said, I developed the course over the summer, it ran that fall and started dropping off. And, and it was discussed about the extra work and I'm thinking, well, I can, I can handle it. However, because of the extra work involved. It's not an online class. It's not a face-to-face, -face, it's both, right? So we have to think of grading. How are you going to grade? If somebody does not attend the synchronous sessions, you have to go through and kind of look at their activity to make sure they're attending and they're keeping up with the work, constant communication. We have to grade different activities possibly for the same need in the grade book. It's extra work, it is. Luckily, uh, and I thank the administration here at Allegheny College, I was able to share with them the work that is involved. And 
from the very beginning, and I, I was kind of very forceful with this in the very beginning because I was the first one, I was the only one um, trying to pioneer this new, new idea. Um, I was able to get them to pay 1.33 credits per credit hour. So essentially, a three credit course is paid at a four credit level. So as you're looking at your load uh, or overload or adjunct scales, whatever, it is paid at 1.33. So I was at that and uh, because, of, because of the extra work, um, I realized it up front. So that's something that it was important to me. I think, Glenda, you were going to talk a little here. Yeah, um, for pedagogy, uh, you know, I, I, we needed to give a lot of thought to clarity and in instructions, choices, expectations. Um, if, 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 you know, just again, the different ways. It's not just students are going to show up to class and they're going to do this. It's students are going to show up to class, they're going to do this. Then these students are going to show up virtually. What are they going to do? How am I going to count attendance participation for them? How am I going to make sure that the instructions are clear for them? How am I going to give them the handouts? I had to post all the handouts uh, on Blackboard beforehand, which was okay because I post all my handouts anyway, but I needed to post them beforehand to make sure that those individuals needed it. For students who were going to be joining asynchronously, when was the assignment going to be due and what were, going, what were they going to do in lieu of you know, the activities that the rest of the class had done um, synchronously or face to face. So that really takes quite a bit of thought, um, you know, in terms of instruction, in terms of rubrics, and just making sure that, stu that students knew if you choose to do this part, it's okay. This is how you're going to get, get graded. If you choose to come back face to face, that's okay. You're going to be still be graded this way. So just know that that's going to take a bit of time, especially on the front end. And then once you, the more you do it, like anything else, it starts making more and more sense. Um, but I think when you first design your course to go into high flights, just know that that's going to take a bit of time. Luckily for us, because of the grant, we had that release time to be able to do it. Um, we we still do not get paid. We still get paid the regular one credit per hour at Montgomery College. That's something that we're hoping to change because, as John said, it is not just face to face. It's not online. It's you're delivering in multiple different ways. So I would encourage you, as you start discussing the design of this, to also immediately on the front end start talking about um, the fact that it does take more time and faculty should compensate, should be compensated for that extra time. Yeah, incidentally, I have a colleague who during this time that we're starting up remotely um, on at some institutions and um, what we did in the spring, he, he's like, now I understand what you did with all that flex work, you know, having to record and post and do the extra work involved. How can you uh, high flex at this point? Well, start small. Think about something that you can um, you can uh, easily convert. I, I want to say easily, but the most meaningful course that you might be able to convert. Like I said, I chose computer literacy because I had more students in that and there were more sections of it. So students then could choose which section they... they um, contents and considerations is... Glenda had talked about when we're discussing um, the ideas of high flex, that's considering your content is important and how you can adjust the activities. Glenda, go ahead and take over. Um, yes, um, expect to have lessons learned, expect to have lots of lessons learned. Um, I think just if you go in it that way, um, and you hit bumps, you'll be like, oh, there goes that bump. I knew I was going to hit eventually. Um, it is not, it, it is not a, a quick conversion. Um, and, and I say this with, I, I, I would do it all over again, despite um, the frustrations and all the obstacles, I would do it all over again. 
but just know, you know, that there are going, you're going to create something, you're going to test it out. It may not work exactly as you expect, so you have to change it. And I also, I'm now in the process of training additional folks at Montgomery College. And I say this to my dean when we're about to identify who is going to be trained for this. I say to my dean, please ensure that person is someone who has a little bit of grit and persistence because uh, we're still, I think we've gotten a lot better and the more institutions do this and the more we do this, we'll obviously get better. But, you know, even if you're, great at what you do. There are internet issues. There are blackboard issues. And those are things that no matter how well prepared you are, that can go at any time. Um, so I think that part is important. Technology is constantly changing. Like I said, if we started with Collaborate, then we moved to um, GoToMeeting, and finally we're in Zoom, you know, before Zoom became so huge, and we were very happy with Zoom. And always have a backup plan when technology fails. Let your students know. If for whatever reason Zoom goes out and you're not able to join, just know that I will be posting something. If it can't be the video, it'll be something else. Uh, and just reassure them um, not to panic because the, the content will be delivered to them one way or another. And remember, as I said earlier, you can do this with a laptop and a free Zoom meeting. Um, you know, it won't be able to look a little bit differently, but you can start that way. Or, you know, if you have the opportunity that I did, we feel very lucky to have this grant, we could go really all out with our technology, which was great. And it allowed us to do more in the classroom. But just know, don't let price tags scare you because there are many flexible budgets. Good point. So let's talk about post-COVID. Um, um, I just want to say, first of all, the institution has to have face-to-face -face courses to be able to have high flex. If not, it's strictly an online course. Even though you're doing it synchronously or asynchronously, it's still an online. So we here at Allegheny College, we are actually in the, in college, I'm on campus now. We started on September tw or October or August 24th um, in class, and so we, everybody has to wear masks, and you know things are sanitized properly. So, at an institution like Montgomery or more uh, suburb or uh, city-based, um, where larger populations, colleges are not in full swing yet uh, in face-to-face -face courses. So you, this could be something you're planning for when things open up um, ag again and, and things are re relaxed a little bit. Uh, just to say during the pandemic, in my flex score, one, I only teach one per semester, there were smooth transitions uh, when everything had to go online in the spring. So there was no disruption, students, experienced little interruption um, when we're talking about moving things online because we were already already doing it with the proper planning ahead, designing the course, everything, and students knew what to do. We didn't have to have, do anything special. So I, it was a great opportunity. I hope to never have to go through that again. I think I, I say that for everybody. We don't want to have to try to put everything online in a week um, ever again, but it was already done. So in the situation that something happens like that again, it's already ready. It was very good. Now, as students are quarantined, I, I actually had one who sent me a message that she was going to go to the, the uh, Med Express because she wasn't feeling well there's a possibility that she could come back and say she has to quarantine. Well, flex course, she can still join us remotely. We don't have to worry about um, students um, coming and affecting other people because everything is online and prepared. Of course, she didn't really come to campus anyway. Um, so it's not like she's spreading it around here. But the idea is it was a great option during the, the COVID times. Now, we're a little late for that and uh, for this semester, that experience, but if it ever happens again, we're ready. So that post-COVID idea, um, 
it, it really was a smooth transition for me. Now, all my other classes, I mean, I had to teach photography and video production at a distance. Uh, crazy. I mean, I was in my living room, you know, I had my son model and I was, you know, getting stuff that students would have around the house and teaching about studio lighting. That was challenging. But this, it was an easy transition because I had already planned it all out. So we want to take, uh, answer any questions we may have not answered to this point because um, we're, we're about to the end of our presentation. I know Glenda has a class to get to um, and I do too. So questions. Let me see if I can see the chat. I can uh, read them. I can read one to you. Uh, Go ahead. Do you give different assignments to each format for all, some, or none of your course assignments? If so, how do you, you ensure these are equitable in terms of time and rigor on the part of the student? So you are the content expert in your field. I mean, I'm multimedia and technology. Um, so I have to determine what would be best for that student to make sure the outcomes are, are met. So maybe it's adjusting the face to, uh, activity and the synchronous activity to match what, what what I need to do online or vice versa. Glenda, you wanna address a little bit? Yeah, I try, I definitely give that thought, um, Terry. Uh, you know, I think about what what is comparable. So if students worked for 20 or 30 minutes developing accommodations for kids with autism um, and, and um, that that uh, I know that video has been posted already. I will say for the asynchronous group, please select two or three video resources or article resources that are different than was already than what was already presented in the from your peers in class. So I I consider that you know I want them. I, I, I really think about the higher order thinking strategies, and and so we try to avoid. Um, some of the recall questions for those types of activities like true false or whatever or otherwise i have to change it around but i think that's the one area where you really have to give it some thought what's comparable um and and what's fair you know for for everybody to have to feel like there is rigor in the different courses regardless of the format um, that you're taking it in I wanted to talk about uh, something that was mentioned at the very beginning about credit hour meeting requirements. Again, we are meeting face to face for the required time. So my credit, my class is a three meeting three times a week, 50 minutes each, which is uh, two and a half hours, which is the required time um, for a three credit course. Again, honestly, face to face and online. Um, so that that meets the requirements of the credit hours uh, as per the state of Maryland. Yeah, and I also want to clarify in case this wasn't clear. Uh, the when students take the choose to take the course or that particular session asynchronously, their task is to watch the the, the meeting the face to face meeting, they have to watch that face to face meeting. And then it's just the assignments that were completed or any of the discussions that were completed during that class that they would have to complete themselves. You're not doing a totally different session for your folks who are joining you asynchronously. So if, if that wasn't clear, I wanted to make sure to clarify. I have to go because I have an 11 o'clock class, but I do want to thank everybody for um, joining us. I don't know how much longer John can stay, but Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Glenda. And actually, there are, it looks like that's it for the questions. And I want to thank both our presenters. They did a wonderful job today. Uh, again, the recording will be sent out soon. Um, and thank you. Great. Thank you. Reach out with any questions. Thank you for all your time. Uh, thank you, Wendy, uh, again, for organizing and uh, arranging it. Sure. Thanks. Take care, everyone.